we've seen already that we can define types in Coq. Let's take a little closer look at types. Every expression in Coq has a type, uh, which describes what it can compute. The Coq com command for checking what the type of an expression is, uh, is check. We already saw that a little bit when I demoed some IDEs. So if you wanted to check what the type of true is, aha, uh -huh, it has type bool. Of course, if you tried to check something that was nonsensical, um, what, what's something nonsensical that we could check here? Check true false. Like that's just not a valid expression at all, right? So now we get a type checking error, in fact. So actually, not every expression in Coq has a type. Uh, really, it's uh, every well-typed expression has a type. OK. So that check command will tell us what the type of, the, of a well-typed expression is, or it'll give us a type checking error. Uh, you can use this if you want, in fact, not to just to check what the type of an expression is, but to guarantee that an expression does have a particular type. You might do this, for example, if you were getting an error message about type checking and you weren't sure what was going on, so you wanted to solidify your own understanding, check your own understanding, as it were, of what the type of an expression is. So suppose I wanted to verify that, in fact, the type of true is bool, then I could write check that true has type bool. The line break there is inessential. I could put those on the same line, in fact. So if I compile that, uh, in fact, it does have type bool, and I get this little second line of output here. In fact, uh, it's guaranteeing that it does have type bool. Uh, or I could check that neg be true has type bool. Doesn't matter whether I put that on two lines or not. Okay. What about neg be itself? This function that negates booleans. Well, in Coq, as in other functional programming languages, and in fact, you can ask what the type of that function is. Uh, their types are called function types, naturally enough, and they're written with arrows. So the type of neg b is bool arrow bool. Uh, now that arrow there, that single right arrow, is in fact a prettified version of dash greater than, so you can write that yourself. And what this is, this is a function type. It takes in an input, whose type must be bool, and it returns an output whose type must be bool. So think of that arrow there as kind of indicating like a flow of information or a transformation that is occurring. Okay, so neg b does in fact type, have type bool arrow bool. It's a function from bool to bool. All right. We can define new types. We've seen that already. We can also uh, build up new type definitions that are based on old ones. That's maybe not something we've seen so far. So here's a more interesting type definition, perhaps, for colors. So we could have a color that is RGB. So this RGB type here has three constructors. One is written red, the other is written green, the other is written bool, uh, sorry, blue. Uh, the, the syntax highlighting on red here is, a, is kind of a, a red herring, as it were. Uh, it's because red standing for reduce is a keyword elsewhere in Coq. And so it's, it's, the editor is getting a little confused there, but that's OK. So we've got an inductive type RGB to represent either exactly red or exactly green or exactly blue. And then we'll build on that. We'll define an inductive type for colors. Um, maybe you could define other inductive types for this based on other color theories or color models. Uh, but here we'll, just for sake of illustration, say that we have a color black, a color white, or a primary color. Now this primary color constructor, written P-R-I-M-A-R-Y, primary, is something that is going to take itself some additional data. It carries along some additional data with it. So that's new. None of these other constructors, red, green, blue, black, white, carried additional data. But primary here does. And we're saying it carries an additional piece of data. We'll call it P here, whose type must be RGB. OK, now that we've defined these two types for colors, Let's, in fact, skip over this. I've defined, I've gone over this for you a little bit already. Uh, let's skip down to here. We can now define functions on those. For example, suppose we wanted a function that uh, told us whether a color was monochrome. Yeah, by that, here I mean whether it's black or white rather than a primary color. Well, I can use pattern matching to figure that out. Match that color with, uh, if it's black, return true. If it's white, return true. Uh, if it's primary, and it doesn't matter what that primary color is, I'll just use P here to stand for it as a variable, return false. OK? So that would tell us whether a color is black or white, whether it's monochrome. OK. Uh, what if we wanted to know whether it's red? Well, now 
I would actually need to do something with that additional data being carried along by the primary constructor. Okay, so is this color red? Well, if it's black, no. If it's white, no. If it is the primary constructor carrying along the additional data that it is red, yes, return true. Now, anything else, though, I should return false for that primary. So there's a nice, convenient way of writing anything else in Coq um, and other functional languages often as well, which is underscore or wild card, or some people call it joker, uh, like a deck of cards with the joker that could stand for anything. OK, so this underscore here, this wild card, means any other data that's carried along here, I want to return false. By the way, I could give it a name as well. I could have written P there, but I'm not going to use P on the right hand side of this. So it's actually stylistically nice to just say, I don't need a name for that. I'm not going to refer to it anywhere. Uh, let me just use underscore. I could have done the same thing up here. I didn't really need to write P there. I could have written underscore for that as well. OK. Uh, if I wanted to be really verbose, another way to write this would have been to say primary green false. Oops, autocomplete got a little too eager there. Or I could write primary blue uh, false, and then I wouldn't even need that last line there. Okay. Uh, but if I left out one of those, for example, primary blue, suppose that were gone. Ah, now when I try to compile that, I get an error. Non-exhaustive pattern matching. No clause found for primary for pattern primary blue. All right, so Cock is actually making sure I've covered all of my cases here, which is a very nice thing for the programming language to do. Helps prevent programming errors. OK, so I could have the blue case in there in particular, or I could just say any other color. Uh, do the underscore there. OK. So pattern matching, by the way, is evaluated from top to bottom. So that's why this branch uh, comes first. Uh, I want to return true if it is red. Uh, if I actually put that down below, uh, say, say here, um, primary red, return true, uh, I would actually get a different error. Pr pattern primary red is redundant in this clause. Why? Because cock is going to check the things that come above first, Here's already a pattern that says, if it's a primary constructor applied to anything, return false. And so with this definition here, uh, in fact, I would be returning false even for the red color, which is obviously wrong. Okay, so I really want those to be in the opposite order there, like that. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to pattern matching and to these inductive types that can carry along data with each constructor.